Al Jazeera has obtained the largest leak of documents in British political history. Oh my God, this is unbelievable. It is absolutely shocking. They tell the inside story of how Sir Keir Starmer, who could be Britain's next prime minister, oversees a lawless party. I've waited 17 months to appear in front of you in this hall as leader of our great party. Hundreds of thousands of internal communications expose how secretive operatives took control of Britain's Labour Party. It's a coup by a group of people to take over one of the major political parties in Britain. Our free speech was shut down in the Labour Party. It looked like somebody is constantly monitoring me, where I'm going and where my car is parked and where my children is going. It just stinks to high heaven what they're doing in the background. And the files reveal how a hierarchy of racism exists under Starmer's leadership. I face more racism in the Labour Party than I have in the rest of my life combined. Shame on you! Shame on you! In episode two, the true story behind the Labour Party's anti-Semitism crisis. Shame on you! I feel so ashamed right now that it's come to this. I'm Jewish! I'm Jewish! And people like you speaking for me! We reveal how truth was subverted. Oh, Jeremy's a racist! And reality turned on its head. The media was not interested in the reality of the story. Shut your mouth! Mr. Corbyn, I'm, I'm from Sky News. From Sky News. Well, goodbye. Uh, Mr. Corbyn, what are you going to do about the perceived anti Semitism in your party? Mr. Corbyn, have you got any comment? Jeremy Corbyn devoted his political career to fighting racism. And suddenly he becomes Labour leader, and uh, the media combines to tell the world that this man is not an anti-racist, he is actually a racist. Mr Corbyn, what's your response? <laughs> It disabled him as a politician and as a potential prime minister. Instead of being able to set out his social democratic vision of social justice, he was obliged to fend off one allegation after another that he was actually a noxious racist or at any rate enabled noxious racists. The I-Unit investigation draws on voices that have been sidelined. Jews who support Jeremy Corbyn, but don't support Israel. And British Palestinians. It was painful as Palestinians. It's very hard for you to enter the debates, and that's how it was designed, designed to be. It draws, too, on the entire contents of the party's disciplinary folders since before Jeremy Corbyn became leader in 2015. We have really detailed data and information that one doesn't normally see about a political party. A veteran anti-racist campaigner analyzes the documents. My mother was a Holocaust survivor who lost dozens of her own family, um, primarily in Auschwitz and Theresienstadt. I am a former ANC member of parliament from South Africa where I served under Nelson Mandela, and I have written and lectured, including at Auschwitz, on genocide prevention. Hundreds of party activists are suspended and expelled on the basis of evidence in these files. It consists largely of social media posts. There are examples of genuine, clear anti-Semitism. You know, here is an, an example that says the enemy is not Muslims or Christians or Judaism. The real enemy is Rothschild Zionism. The Rothschild family holds about 80% of the world's total wealth, Rothschild dynasty. This is a fairly standard anti-Semitic trope. Here is another one. Who killed JFK? Who killed Lincoln? Who attacked the USS Liberty? Who is attacking our liberty? I'll tell you who Jews. 
we can see real anti-Semitism. But then there is also a lot of information in these disciplinary files where there is clearly no anti-Semitism whatsoever. There's one post that reads, in memory of four little footballers, rest in peace. And I'm sure many people will recall um, these four young kids, nine to 11 years old, playing football on the beach, who were shot dead by Israeli forces. Another example, we demand that International Criminal Court and the UN charge Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel for war crimes against humanity. Very similar. Put Israel on trial for war crimes. To suggest that this is somehow anti-Semitic is simply trying to avoid Israel being called out for its appalling abuses in the occupied territories. Many of those investigated by the Labour Party believe that Israel is an apartheid state. Israel was created in 1948 by forming a Jewish homeland within historic Palestine, the culmination of the Zionist dream. In 1967, Israel invaded and occupied the remaining Palestinian land. Israel has since isolated Gaza while building illegal settlements in the West Bank slowly diminishing the size of a potential Palestinian state. Palestinians effectively live under Israeli military control and do not have equal rights. It's not anti-Semitic to uh, call Israel an apartheid state. It's simply a fact. We, we have the Amnesty International report, the Human Rights Watch report, we have Israel's own one, you know, its major human rights organizations, B'Tselem, have also come to this conclusion. It's somehow implicitly understood that there are things you can't say. So one of them is you can't talk about your experiences in harrowing terms. You have to keep it sort of cool. Um, and you can't t talk about Israel in the way that it should be talked about. When I started hearing and getting more active about anti-Semitism, I was just confused because you don't, Palestinians never chose who their occupier was. They didn't choose who forced them out of their homes. They didn't choose which religion they were going to say they acted in the name of. There was no choice in that. Time to apologize, Mr. Livingston. Accusations of anti Semitism in the Labour Party emerge after former London mayor Ken Livingston is attacked for claiming that Hitler had been a supporter of Zionism. You're a lying racist. Really? Why don't you go and a, a Nazi history. apologist. A Nazi history. apologist. A Nazi apologist. You dare say, you dare history. say that Hitler supported Zionism. You're up, you've, you've lost it, mate. You I need know. help. Go you back need help. Thing. You need help. help. The very existence of my party, the Labour Party, is at stake. Every racist anti seamount out of the Labour Party. It's time for Jeremy Corbyn to act. Criticism of the Labour Party mounts. But not all British Jews oppose the Labour leader. The row over anti Semitism exposes divisions within the Jewish community. Lots of Jewish people were among the enthusiasts for Jeremy Corbyn. But when the attacks started to really ratchet up against Jeremy and his supporters, who were being absolutely demonized and vilified in the media, we talked to others in the party and decided that there was a need for a group which expressed an alternative Jewish view. Pro-Corbyn Jews form Jewish Voice for Labour. JVL is critical of Israel and Zionism. 
unlike its larger rivals, the Jewish labor movement and labor friends of Israel, both of which are supportive of Israel. For the first time ever, the Labour Party has walked into the disagreement between Jews over Zionists and said one sort of Jews are not only wrong, but they're guilty of anti-Semitism. It's a phenomenon. The idea that Jew equals Zionist and that anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism is, is dangerous, it's reprehensible, it's an abomination to me. Jewish Voice for Labour is supported by Palestinians in the party, who believe they are the victims of racism. Anybody who knows anything about the history knows very well that Israel was created on the basis of a state whose population would be of one community and not others. This is exemplified in my own story. I mean, why should I and my family have left our homes? We felt we had to leave because there had been a dreadful massacre in a village called Deir Yassin, Palestinian village, in which Jewish uh, militias assaulted the village and shot dead over a hundred people. After that terrible massacre, a big jeep went round the streets of Jerusalem with the militias, with these Jewish militias in it, uh, leaders, uh, shouting out, uh, your turn is next. And I have never been allowed to return. No member of my family has returned. No Palestinian I know has been allowed to return for the same racist reason. They are of the wrong race. So you keep them out. Well, if that isn't racism, I don't know what is. <laughs> Two of Corbyn's opponents confront pro-Palestinian protesters. Off our street, terrorists are bombs. Off our street. Most anti-Semitism campaigners belong to the political mainstream, but some are more militant. Terrorists are bombs. So what we have here are militant Zionists the people who campaign for the State of Israel. Paul Scott is a pro-Palestinian activist. You get to know all the faces. It's actually only a very small core of people. They are always there. In many cases, the people they perceive to be anti-Semites are merely people who criticize the State of Israel. Jonathan Hoffman is a former vice chair of the Zionist Federation. With him is Damon Lenzner, another pro-Israel activist. Following this incident, both men are convicted of aggressive bullying behavior. The aim is to provoke, to heckle, and in Jonathan Hoffman's case, it's usually to disrupt. The I unit has discovered links between Hoffman and a far right organization. Members of the Racist English Defense League, or EDL, attended a demonstration that Hoffman helped organize. He is photographed alongside Roberta Moore, the founder of the EDL's Jewish division. She will later express her admiration for Anders Breivik, the neo Nazi who murdered 77 people in Norway. From around June 2010, the English Defence League started coming to the demonstrations supporting the pro-Israel counter-demonstrators. So they were dressed in, in camouflage gear, they often had balaclavas, dogs with them, St George's flags, you know, the whole thing. 
Hoffman is not the only pro-Israel activist who had links to the far right. He worked closely with blogger Richard Millett. Millett's blog regularly provided a platform for Roberta Moore and other EDL supporters. There are lots of examples of outright r racism in Roberta Moore's comments on Richard Millett's blog. For example, she refers to burqa-clad dragons and filthy bearded vermin. Arabs have been eating camel for years. The cult of Islam has the power to turn normal human beings into beasts. Hoffman and Millet distanced themselves from the EDL in 2011, but they will play a key role in Labour's anti-Semitism crisis. The majority of Corbyn's critics do not embrace far-right politics, but they blame Corbyn for allowing anti-Semitism to flourish. Say now in unison, so that he can hear you over there. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. But Corbyn has a problem, one that is ignored in the media coverage. As leader of the opposition, Corbyn has his own office, often known as Lotto. It's the party's general secretary, Ian McNichol, who is in charge of party headquarters. And it's the disputes unit at party headquarters that handles anti-Semitism complaints. Corbyn inherited the party bureaucracy from previous, less radical party leaders. For the first two and a half years of his leadership, Jeremy Corbyn was obliged to work with a general secretary who was hostile to him and, and ran a party machinery which was hostile to him. I've never worked in a, uh, an environment that was so sort of toxic and, and uh, you know, toxic and unfriendly. I remember, for example, the first time I went and walked around uh, HQ and we were just walking around one of the floors and it just goes deathly silent. The Labour files contain a WhatsApp conversation between three senior officials. Claire Francis Fuller, the head of internal governance. Tracy Allen, manager of the General Secretary's office and Mike Crichton, the Director of Audit, Risk and Property. The messages refer to Jeremy Corbyn. I am just about to stab him. That might be a disciplinary. Worth it, though. Nothing in the rules about stabbing. Poor form, though. Ian's got some great knives, but an ice pick would have a certain irony. This is a reference to the General Secretary Ian McNichol, and to the murder of Leon Trotsky. Would killing your leader with an ice pick or knife not come under bringing the party into disrepute? Not in this case. Reading this, there's about a dozen people in this WhatsApp group, the most senior officials in the Labour Party. They obviously have total confidence in one another that this conversation is not going to be leaked. They're not taking orders from Mr. Corbyn, quite the opposite. They obviously hold the party leadership in, in contempt. After a year as leader, Corbyn is forced to stand for a second time following an attempted coup. While the party establishment challenges Corbyn, he inspires hundreds of thousands of new members to join. Staff at party headquarters launch what is known as the validation process. They scour the social media of new members. It's claimed the goal is to weed out those who hold offensive views. The Labour files reveal the methodology used by party staff. They draw up a list of Labour MPs and search for abuse directed at them and only at those MPs. If you look at the name of the MPs, and I've got a list of, of 57, and the very odd thing is, as far as I can see, there's scarcely a single supporter of Jeremy Corbyn on this list. It kind of loads it in a very significant way, but it's only going to pick up those hostile 
to uh, the right wing of the party, i.e. Corbynite supporters. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. We've had a bit of a... More than 11,000 members are identified as needing to be investigated. It creates a backlog in the disciplinary unit and diverts staff from tackling anti-Semitism. Factionalism within the Labour Party was so endemic and so pronounced that it actually was disrupting the Labour Party's ability to deal with, for example, anti-Semitism cases. The validation process is run by Sam Matthews, who soon becomes head of the disputes team handling anti-Semitism. Denial is not an option. Prevarication is not an option. Being a bystander who turns their head the other way is not an option. The time for action is now. By the spring of 2018, Corbyn is as frustrated as his critics. The Labour files show that in February that year, Corbyn writes to the party's general secretary Ian McNichol, angry that the disputes team under Sam Matthews is so ineffective in tackling anti-Semitism. It is clear that the current processes are far too slow to meet the volume of disciplinary cases the party has to deal with. In a draft response, McNichol claims the scale of anti-Semitism in the party is exaggerated. Over half of the complaints made relate to non-members and therefore are not a matter for the complaints team. He urges Corbyn to... Remind colleagues in the Shadow Cabinet and the Parliamentary Labour Party that misguided comments attacking the unit undermine the work they do and serve only those in the right-wing press. In April 2018, Corbyn puts close ally Jenny Formby in charge of the party bureaucracy. Formby replaces McNichol as General Secretary at party headquarters, finally giving the leadership authority over the disputes department. Staff brought in by Formby to work on disputes are appalled at what they find. There was no record keeping, so a number of members had been suspended or investigated. However, we couldn't find the evidence for what, what caused the suspension or the investigation. So it was clear to me that cases just hadn't been worked on. So for me to start in 2019 and have first eyes on cases from 2016 was quite absurd. Once Corbyn is in control of the party bureaucracy, the disciplinary process improves. This graph shows the number of suspensions, investigations and expulsions from the Labour Party on grounds of anti-Semitism all through the Corbyn era. And this is the moment when Jenny Formby becomes General Secretary of the Labour Party, enabling Jeremy Corbyn to take control of the bureaucracy of how Labour works. After they took control, the number of investigations, suspensions and expulsions went up exponentially. This graph on its own does a great deal to raise deep questions about the dominant media narrative on the Corbyn era. In part two, how the party's desperation to end the anti-Semitism crisis pushed staff to the brink. There was an individual who I had expelled as she had a stroke which led to her death. Is something that deeply, deeply impacted me, I think. Having gained control of the party bureaucracy, the Corbyn leadership made tackling anti-Semitism a priority. There were many instances where I did feel quite uncomfortable in terms of how far they were pursuing individuals for anti-Semitism. We were instructed to scour through Facebook pages and social media pages of individuals who we were looking for anti-Semitic material for. The word Palestine was included as a search term, which was the thing that alarmed me the most. We would act almost immediately to any inquiries that would come in from the Jewish Chronicle or Jewish News. Um, even if it was, you know, at close of play, we would often get 
instructed by the directors to just stay behind so we can take action on those, those individuals. The Labour files reveal that anti-Semitism campaigners are scouring social media accounts for evidence to send to Labour headquarters. One has to understand that this was a social media crisis, that it involved people crawling through extraordinary numbers of social media accounts to find examples that could be interpreted as anti-Semitism. So what we have here is the anti-Semitism cases logs, which logs every single complaint of anti-Semitism made during the Corbyn years and after the Corbyn years. 23% of all complaints in the Corbyn era involved one single individual complainant. 23%. 12% came from the organization Labour Against Anti-Semitism. Labour Against Anti-Semitism is a collective of party activists. It regularly makes accusations against Jewish party members. But its spokesman, Ewan Phillips, is not Jewish. The Labour files show that Phillips writes to the party's disputes unit using a pseudonym that appears Jewish. David Gordstein. On one occasion, he uses his real name. Thank you, Ewan. He hastily corrects himself. I meant, thank you, David. Labour Against Anti-Semitism does have a Jewish advisor. Whether Jeremy Corbyn is an anti-Semite or not, he just has too many anti-Semitic associations, too many terrorist associations to be able to be trusted in Downing Street. Jonathan Hoffman at one time demonstrated alongside the English Defence League. Now, he's on mainstream TV news. From Jewish Voice for Labour and Jonathan Hoffman, who is a consultant to the Labour Against Anti-Semitism group. Thank you both for joining us. It's absolutely not satisfactory. And the issues with the, between the Jewish community and between Labour and anti-Semitism, which I represent, and Labour Party will go on after today. <laughs> The blog run by Richard Millett becomes the source for a number of stories about Corbyn's alleged anti-Semitism. They include a 2013 incident when Corbyn accused a group of Zionists of lacking a sense of English irony. The Zionists present at the meeting he was describing were Millett and Hoffman. I am just dumbstruck. These people consorted with known right-wing extremists, with known racists, with Islamophobes. When they have a story about what they perceive to be anti-Semitism, they're taken seriously and at face value by the mainstream media, who don't seem to conduct any kind of research into their background or their associates. I'm just amazed at the hypocrisy. At Labour headquarters, the pressure over anti-Semitism takes a toll. There was an individual who I had expelled out of the Labour Party for anti-Semitism, and she was an elderly lady. And she passed away soon after her expulsion, and people were blaming the party's expulsion, leading to her death, as she had a stroke which led to her death. We had a team meeting, and in the meeting, a senior officer had laughed and said, look, we're anti-Semite killers now. And the whole room broke out in laughter. At that stage, I just broke down because, you know, I, I just didn't know how to deal with something so horrendous. I blamed myself is something that deeply, deeply impacted me, I think. You Nazi You Nazi scum. You should burn in the gas oven, you dirty Nazi cow. 
now you are sticking, sticking swine. I hope you die in a gas oven. You deserved everything you did in hell to burn in acid. Police discovered this answer phone threat has been left by a Jewish man. I, I was very, very shaky. I mean, it's such kind of absolutely uncontrollable rage and fury. I mean, the idea that Jews should be talking to other Jews in this vile way. Jewish supporters of Jeremy Corbyn find themselves in an increasingly hostile environment. I have had phone calls. I had some phone calls from somebody who said he was outside my door and he knew, you know, he knew my home and he knew where I lived and he was going to put me in a wheelchair and then that sort of thing, yeah. I met what to me was utterly cruel nastiness from the local Labour Party. And what was so cruel was that I'd been a member of the Labour Party since I was a young socialist at 15 or something. And I used to love the Labour Party. I had friends here, people turned against me, people I knew. People who my children babysat for their children. And they'll say, you know, don't go, don't cross over and talk to Jenny Manson. It's Jenny Manson, you know, that kind of thing. It's been horrible. Your opinion has been all over the media. This is my turn to have my no, own opinion. I'm standing here and I'm entitled to there express is, my no. view. Let her have an interview. Use force. Use I'm not force. using force. No. I'm trying to stop you disrupting an interview no. so that everyone can have their voice heard. disrupting the interview. This is what happens when you try to raise a different view. I'm ashamed of you and all those that... Shame on you! 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 While pro-Corbyn Jews find themselves shouted down, Palestinian voices are silenced almost entirely. The crisis in the Labour Party in 2018 coincides with the Great March of Return in the Gaza Strip. A group of unarmed people marched to the barrier that Israel had erected between Gaza and the rest of the country, and uh, demanding uh, that they should return to their homes and lands. The Israelis responded with fire. In eight months, over 150 Palestinians are killed. It was inspiring in one way to see the strength and resilience of the Palestinian people. But at the same time, it was absolutely devastating. They shot a journalist, Yasser Matoja, a member with a press vest on. They shot a, a nurse with her hands up. I mean, these were war crimes being committed. But then at the same time, everything in the Labour Party was, it was a different world. It wasn't talked about. It wasn't um, put at the forefront. And they, they were, the, the headlines were on anti-Semitism. And so I feel like a lot of people, when it came to Palestine, felt like they had to walk in eggshells in order to get the terminology exactly right. People become more and more fearful of speaking up for the Palestinian people uh, because it's easier not to. Enthusiastic campaigners increasingly focus their efforts on compelling the Labour Party to adopt a new definition of anti-Semitism. I'd be very clear that only the full adoption of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism is good enough. No ifs, no buts, no caveats. The NEC has got to adopt the internationally agreed code, lock, stock and barrel. Palestinians opposed the new definition. The IHRA definition was eagerly taken up by Western governments uh, and, and Western institutions, um, and it was blatantly 
blatantly pro-Israeli and anti and therefore anti-Palestinian. The controversy around the definition concerns the examples that accompany it. These are the 11 illustrative examples of the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. Seven of them, these in red, refer to Israel. It conflates criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. The seventh one, denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, for instance, by claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor, is particularly problematic because by acknowledging the right to self-determination of the Jewish people, you are by definition removing the right of self-determination from the Palestinian people. There was a lot of attempts to push back. Truthfully, I think at that time period, there was very minimum success in pushing the Palestinian narrative into the media around this issue. To me, what I remember is there basically being near to none. Labour's ruling National Executive Committee is gathering to discuss whether to adopt the IHRA definition. Outside are familiar pro-Israel activists. Inside, the NEC passes the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, including the examples that link anti-Semitism to criticism of Israel. We adopted the IHRA because it was politically impossible to hold up why you know why you wouldn't. Day after day on the media, there are Jewish voices who want the IHRA definition. The counter pressure from Palestinian voices in the media and so on was absent. I wasn't surprised that it passed. They created a climate where I think many people thought that the only way the attacks would stop is if this definition was passed. But I wish, I just wish that Jeremy Corbyn had stood up for what he truly believed in at that time. Our exit poll is suggesting that there will be a conservative majority. The Labour Party suffers one of its worst electoral defeats. Jeremy Corbyn is replaced as Labour leader by Sir Keir Starmer. It is the honour and the privilege of my life to be elected as leader of the Labour Party. The new leader has a very different view of the relationship between Israel and the Palestinians. Amnesty International recently released a report where they accused Israel of being an apartheid state. Yeah. That was embraced and supported by many members of your party, particularly on the, on the left. Um, do you agree with them? No. Um, I've been very clear about that. Um, and that is not the Labour Party um, position. Staff in the party's disputes department feel a change. I believe the criteria for anti-Semitism changed quite dramatically within Keir's leadership. It was quite clear that anti-Semitism was going to be used as a tool under the new leadership to essentially strike out as many left-wing members as possible. Many Jews are among those targeted by the new leadership. At least 56 Jewish people that we know of have at some point during this completely insane period in Labour Party history been either investigated, suspended or actually expelled from the party for something to do with anti-Semitism. Jewish members of the Labour Party, we've calculated, are 6.3 times more likely to be investigated by the Labour Party for allegations of anti-Semitism than non-Jews in the Labour Party. People have written about the false allegations of anti-Semitism. People have written about their experience of, um, uh, of their uh, increasing anger with Israel and Palestine. We call that anti-Semites. We're all old. Our parents were Holocaust victims, effectively. My mother escaped a pogrom. How dare they tell us they're anti-Semitic? And how dare they challenge us that we don't know what anti-Semitism is? 
The leaders of Jewish groups that support Israel hold a Zoom call with the Labour Party spokesman on communities and local government, Steve Reed. The plan is to discuss anti-Semitism. But the conversation quickly turns to BDS, the campaign to boycott Israeli goods and divest from the country in order to pressure Israel to end its occupation of Palestinian land. Israel is deeply concerned about BDS, and the British Conservative Party has agreed to introduce legislation making it illegal for public bodies to boycott Israel. The Labour files contain the minutes of the meeting. Amanda Bowman is vice president of the influential board of deputies of British Jews. According to the minutes, she introduced the topic of BDS legislation. She understands that while Labour might hesitate to support Tories on anti-BDS legislation, she advises that Labour would be unwise to do anything to oppose this. Bowman went on. The Board of Deputies are keen to counter suppositions from Labour MPs that because they're nominally committed to combating anti-Semitism, that it gives them carte blanche to say what they like about Israel. Reid assured her he would never accept attempts to exceptionalize and delegitimize Israel. Reading that document and seeing it like laid out quite clearly, this mix-up of anti-Semitism, opposing racism towards the Jewish community, and opposing BDS policy in in one in one meeting is quite shocking to see. BDS for Palestinians is a way of pressuring Israel to comply with international law, to end the illegal occupation of Palestine, and to adhere and give Palestinians equal rights. It shows that basically it is not enough to combat anti-Semitism. You have to counter any attempts to show solidarity and effective solidarity with the Palestinian people. After six years of rigorous investigations, the Labour Party found sufficient evidence to open anti-Semitism-related investigations into less than half of 1% of its membership. That figure includes many of the interviewees in this film. They have created an incredibly hostile environment for anybody including any Jew who is in any way critical of Israel. To be accused of racism, to be accused of anti-Semitism, is frankly terrifying. <laughs> and most important of all, it has silenced Palestinians the victims of Israeli apartheid, the victims of occupation, the victims of oppression, and it has silenced those who wish to support them. I was invited to speak to the constituency uh, about Palestine. And I was very glad to do it. Now that constituency, no Hackney North is known to be a left-wing, uh, pro-Palestinian, generally pro-Palestinian constituency. So I felt really I was among friends. I remember saying something like, there are two Palestines now. There's Palestine over there, which is the, obviously the conflict with Israel, occupied territories, etc., and the Palestine over here, which is the one where we are being silenced, where this IHRA definition is being used. That's what I wanted to talk about. Well, I didn't get a chance. The chairperson of the meeting stopped me, just like that. 
stop me dead and said, no, we can't go on with this. We can't go on with this. Thank you very much. And I was cut off. Just like that. It, it, I can't describe the way I felt. It was like a slap in the face. It was like being elbowed out physically of a meeting, a door opening and being thrown out into the corridor. It, it felt just like that. In episode three of The Labour Files, how Keir Starmer allowed a culture of racism to develop in the Labour Party. There's a point at which the people involved in this have stopped regarding people of African heritage as human. They really don't like people who are black or brown and on the left. <laughs> 